Good morning. You guys are catching on. It's good. <laughs> well, the first Christmas was far from perfect, and um, those beautiful Christmas cards that you get, you know, um, the pictures that we see, um, man, those, those can be a little bit deceiving. Um, as we study through this message series the, in the month of December, um, we're going to take an honest look at the mess of the first Christmas, and even how... Um, even though there's many challenges, even in the middle of all the craziness, there was still love, joy, hope, and peace to be found. And um, I absolutely love all things Christmas. I, I love it. I love the decor. I love the, isn't this Christmas tree amazing, by the way? Um, thank you to those of you that did that. It was not me. It wouldn't look like that if I did it. Um, but I love the decor, I, lo I love the music, you know, the food especially is good. But if I, if I had to pick one thing I love the most, um, I absolutely love Christmas movies. I don't know about you guys, but that just makes it come alive for me. And in fact, um, man, December 1st, we are, as a family, we're, we're grabbing something hot when, after dinner, and we are um, going to watch something most nights of the week. doesn't matter if it's the weekend. We, like, we love Christmas movies. And so I wanted to, to share with you guys probably our top five, like we have to watch these first. Um, and then after that, then we start watching other ones, you know. Um, but these are probably my top five, and, and I want to share these with you. But I also want to see if you like the same movies as me. And so if you like, if you happen to like um, the movie that, that I uh, share, I want you to raise your hand, okay? We, we all good? Okay, so number one, uh, I would have to say my, my top Christmas movie, you may be surprised by this, It's a Wonderful Life. You like it or no? Some of you guys, have you ever seen this movie? If you've not seen it, raise your hand if you've never seen it. You've never seen this. You guys blow my mind. It is time. <laughs> this is the year to watch It's a Wonderful Life. It's, I don't know, I like it. Okay, number, coming in at number two, I would have to say Home Alone, um, which that's like, yeah, one and two, definitely not when it gets to 12, those ones aren't as good. Um, but Home Alone one and two, those are like, we gotta watch those. Um, three on the list I would say is Elf, it's the most quotable movie, you guys like that? It's pretty good. Um, then, then comes next would be The Grinch That Stole Christmas, the Jim Carrey version. You guys with me? It's pretty funny, pretty good. Um, and then number five would be Christmas with the Cranks. We just always watch it, I don't know. It's pretty good. How many of you guys like that one? Some of you, cool, all right. Um, and then, then after that, then we're in the Christmas spirit and we can start looking for other movies, you know what I mean? Um, but as much as I love Christmas and, I, and it looks like a lot of you guys like Christmas, um, I do realize that along with the fun, Sometimes Christmas can get messy. And for some, for some of us, Christmas brings out um, and maybe even magnifies our area of struggle. So if we're struggling financially, we're going to really notice that at Christmas. If we're struggling relationally, um, that's, that's going to be magnified. If we're struggling even with our emotional health, like that's, that's going to come out at Christmas. If you're struggling because maybe you've lost somebody and they're not there for Christmas, or you've had a separation of some kind in your family, you're going to notice that. And for some of us, the busy schedules, um, you know, expectations from family and friends, maybe even at work, Christmas can all of a sudden become super stressful and, and even messy. And all it takes is something unexpected that happens whether an event or something, that all of a sudden can, can put us into a tailspin. Today we're going to look at the mess of the first Christmas and observe two big unexpected things that happened. And so um, we're going to look at, at Mary and Joseph, this story, that, um, uh, this beautiful first Christmas story, but two unexpected things happened. One is an unexpected pregnancy and the second one we're going to look at is an unexpected journey. And so if you have your Bible, I would encourage you to turn uh, to Luke. And we're going to be in the first chapter, verse 26. If you don't have a paper Bible, I just want you to know that there's two little black tables in the back of the room. Um, there's Bibles on those. Those are free. If you need a paper Bible, take one with you. Or if you just want to use it today, that's fine too. 
Um, but if you don't have a paper Bible, I would encourage you to grab one. Use that thing. Underline it. Put your name in it. It's yours. Um, but let's start in Luke 1, verse 26. It says, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever in his kingdom. There will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was barren. Listen to this. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. So six months before this, the same angel Gabriel had visited Zechariah and told him that his super old wife uh, was going to have a baby and, and that his name was going to be John. Here's what's crazy. Zechariah was a, he was a priest and he did not believe the angel. And so the angel shut uh, him up pretty much where he couldn't talk for, till the baby was born. Um, kind of uh, crazy. But the reason that this is so interesting is because this is literally the opposite of the way that Mary reacted when the same angel came to her. Huge contrast here. Mary reacted, let it be so. I mean, yeah, she's a little freaked out when, when they first met and when the angel first came, um, which most people that are visited by angels in Scripture, that's exactly what happens. It's a little overwhelming. But her actual reaction is, let it be so. The angel Gabriel is actually mentioned 32 times in Scripture, Old Testament and New Testament. And every time that he's mentioned, he freaks the person out that he's visiting. Um, but Mary would have been about 16 or 17 years old, and uh, she was a virgin. She was engaged uh, to be married to this young man named Joseph, who was a descendant of King David. And um, Mary was poor. She's from this no-name little place called Nazareth. And, um, you know, but overall, Mary's life is good, and she's kind of a normal teenager doing the normal things. In that time, it wasn't weird to be uh, betrothed to be married at that age. And, um, you know, pretty ordinary teenager, pretty ordinary life, really. But God chose Mary for the most important mission ever, to be the mother of Jesus. Just like with Mary... God is more than able to choose you and equip you and use you to do things for his purpose. And God is known for leading people to things that are way beyond our own ability and definitely outside of our comfort zone. It's not, it's not really uncommon when you look through Scripture to see God lead people in unexpected ways. I love what verse 37 says. It says, nothing is impossible with God. That's a big deal. If, if you could put that, that whole passage into a sentence, nothing is impossible with God. Mary submitted herself to God's will, and she wasn't expecting to carry the Savior of the world. She wasn't expecting this, but she trusted God. And, and surrendered herself to him. And so I have a really personal question I want to ask you this morning. I want to ask you a question that I want you to think about for a second. What area of your life is God waiting for you to surrender to him? 
Really think about that. What area in your life is God waiting for you to fully just surrender to him and trust him? Is it, maybe it's your finances. Maybe you're freaking out about it. Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe it's your future. Um, it could be parenting. It could be just a relationship that you have. What area of your life is God waiting for you to fully surrender to him? There's four things in what we just read um, where the, that the angel predicted. Four things. And I, wanna, I don't want to gloss over that. I want us to stop for a second because I think it's really important because all four of these things came true. Um, the first thing is that um, the angel said to Mary, you will be pregnant by the Holy Spirit and your baby's name will be Jesus. Um, this is important because Jesus is the Greek name for the same exact name in Hebrew, which is Joshua. And Joshua, and they, they really, when they named people back then, they like picked names based on what they meant versus like, oh, that's a cool name. Like, you know, um, and Joshua in Hebrew, it means the Lord saves. And so they, they, they took it seriously and, and his name was Jesus. That was on purpose. Number two, the angel predicted that they would call him the son of the most high. So he would be called the son of God. Number three is he would, be, um, he would come from the throne of his father, David. Um, his, his father, Joseph, was in the line of David. And so this was true. And then number four is said that his kingdom will never end. What is that talking about? Heaven. His kingdom will never end. And so now, after looking at the unexpected pregnancy, now let's, let's move into uh, another area of unexpectedness, uh, an unexpected journey. And now we're going we're gonna to move forward a little bit uh, into Luke 2, and we're just going to look at these first five verses here and, um, and look at this unexpected journey. So follow with me. It says, In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Cunerius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. It'd be really easy for us to just kind of skim over these verses and go, cool. They went on a little trip. Nice. And honestly, in the past, I have read that and gone, cool. They went on a trip. Um, but I want us to stop for a second this morning and really think about what this trip would have been like. Um, this trip from uh, a place called Nazareth to a place called Bethlehem. And um, if you looked at the map, you would see that uh, in, this is a 90-mile trip. How many of you guys have ever been to Pops in Arcadia? You know, where you drink the big glass bottles of pop? Uh, nobody? Not one person. Okay, all of you. Awesome. Uh, okay. Well, uh, it's pretty much close to Edmond, you know. Um, that is literally from here. It's 90 miles from here to Pops. And so I want you to imagine walking there. Um, so if, if it was two, uh, if you're walking kind of a normal walking pace, which is 2.5 miles an hour, um, eight hours a day, it is going to take you a week. It's going to take you a week to get there. Isn't that crazy? And this is averaging 10, 10 to 15 miles per day. And, um, and I'll just be honest with you. I mean, I, I love this picture and all, but nowhere in Scripture does it say that she was riding a donkey. We kind of like, you know, assume that. And it's very possible. That would have been kind of culturally normal. But can I be honest with you? If I'm a pregnant woman, which I have no idea what that's like, but if I was a pregnant woman... I don't know which one would be better to just walk or ride on a, you know, sort of like a dingbat of a cat or a horse or whatever. You know, a donkey is not like the thing I would want to have to ride for, you know, a week. Anyways, either way, this is a, a exhausting, exhausting trip. And they would have headed south along the flatlands of the Jordan River, and then they would have went uh, west over the hills surrounding Jerusalem, and then down into Bethlehem. And the trip uh, through the Judean desert would have been during winter, and it would have been like 30 degrees during the day, and very possible to have some sleet and, and snow, rain, whatever, um, just absolutely cold and gross. That's what it was like during the winter right there. 
And so they would have, they would have dressed for it, you know. Um, they would have protected themselves from the cold. Joseph and Mary both probably would have had a big wool kind of outer cloak and then kind of an inner robe with the belt right, you know, tying it in the middle. Uh, some big old woolly old tube socks and maybe some closed toed shoes. I'm just trying to paint the picture. And they would have, do you know how that is when like you go outside and play in the snow and somehow you're soaking wet, but you're also hot and you're also cold? Yeah, probably would have been like that. And so they're going on this long journey and, um, and that seems like, oh man, that, that would be a little crazy. Well, can I tell you something? Even though it's unpaved, it's hilly, and the weather's not great, there's also some other things that would have freaked them out a little bit on this journey. Um, archaeologists have unearthed some documents warning travelers of some things in this forest. Um, and so uh, the, the forest that is by the Jordan River was known for having, I'm not kidding you, lions, bears, and wild boars. And so, as if it wasn't enough that the weather's terrible and they got to go really far, I mean, it's literally possible that an animal could attack them at any point. And if that's not enough, um, this trade route was known for robbers. It was known for people hiding in the bushes. And um, so if it's not a stinking lion, then it's some dude jumping out trying to steal your stuff. And what, they, what would happen is um, people would have to carry everything. So if you're going to go on a journey for a week, like I just jump in the car and drive to Edmond, they have to have all their food for the whole week. They have to have whatever they're going to sleep on. I mean, they got a lot of stuff. And so people would take advantage of this, and they would rob them of everything they had. Um, Joseph and Mary would have had to bring their own provisions. So they would have had to carry all of their probably bread, because it wouldn't go rotten, and probably a whole bunch of water and some wineskins. They just would have carried it. And so I'm just trying to paint the picture for you of like, they got a lot of stuff. It's very dangerous. The weather's terrible. And it's a long, stinking way to go. Whether she's on a donkey or walking, either way, she's nine months pregnant. And this is quite a journey, okay? It was long. It was hard. Um, it was dangerous. But God protected Mary and Joseph on this completely unexpected trip. Expect God in our lives to do the unexpected. Expect God to do the unexpected. This is how he works. This is how he moves. God will use unexpected things in your life to accomplish his will. In 2012, um, there's, there's a, a violinist named Joshua Bell. He's famous at the time. And um, he spent 43 minutes on the subway, uh, kind of disguised, had a hat, on, a hat on, and he was just... Um, trying to see if he could earn a few tips without people knowing who he was. He's literally the best violinist in the world at the time, famous, but he wanted to kind of see, uh, it's kind of a social experiment, just to see what would happen. And so uh, in the 43 minutes that he played, he played six classical pieces, and out of the 1,097 people that walked through during those 40, uh, 43 minutes, 27 people threw a little change in, and it added up to 50 bucks, um, which is not very much, uh, especially since $20 of that was someone that recognized him, wrote him a note, and put a 20 in there. So really, he got 30 bucks. And um, two days before he did this, he played uh, in a sold-out Boston theater, 100 bucks a ticket. This is back in 2012, you know. And when I heard this story, I just started thinking about how easy it is for us to miss beautiful things because of busyness, because of the mess of life, because of um, distraction, right? And it's so easy for us during the Christmas season, it gets so busy and we get so focused on things that honestly probably don't matter a ton that we can miss the beautiful moments with our family, with God. So this Christmas season, I just want to encourage all of us, me included, to just slow down a little bit and focus on the things that actually matter. And just pray. Can we just, like today, even during our time of response, can we stop and just pray and ask God to help us not be so distracted? Help us to, to see past the mess of life. Like, we all have it, guys. You walked in here with stuff. I did, too. 
and ask God, God, can you just help me see past the mess? And can you help me focus on you and family and the things that actually matter? And even when unexpected things come, which they probably will, that we could see God moving and we could see the beauty in the mess. You close your eyes. I want to enter into a time of response. Every week at our church, we, we stop and, and we just worship God and we talk to Him. We process whatever it is that He said to us during this time. God, we trust you in the mess. God, I pray that we could see how you're moving, see how you're working in the, in the stress and the mess of life. And God, we thank you for Mary. We thank you for her example, how she just said yes. She trusted you. Even though things were uncertain, she believed you. And God, I pray that we would be the same way, that we'd have faith, that we would trust in you, that even though life can be messy and things, unexpected things can come, God, help us to trust you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.